that marries art with fashion. But is it really art? Or is it just another fashion fad? And what All right. Yeah, good to see you, Bill. Good to see you, Shane. How are you? I'm very good. Thank you for uh, taking the time to talk to me. Sure. Yeah, you know, I guess uh, I should just uh, start with the... Um, I should start with the one question I want to ask you that's from your past. How'd you get a bomb into the Pentagon? Yeah, that uh, those who know don't tell and those who tell won't don't know. Yeah, I guess so. Um, I'm talking, I, I contacted you about might is right and, and Satanism and, and how that stuff's being interpreted. And I was interested in talking to you about that because that all started back in, in the day when when all this uh, theater of the absurd was popping, like with the Black Panthers or the White Panthers or the Yippies. So I always saw like Anton LaVey's thing is sort of tied into that stuff. Do you, when, when that was happening, do you remember it popping? Do you, did you hear about the church of Satan or Anton LaVey's stuff? In the, in I, don't the, think so. I don't think I had any consciousness of it at all. So that wasn't going through the con, uh, the counterculture at all. Well, I'm not, I, I'm not saying it wasn't going through the counterculture. I have no idea. I was just one hippie trying to make my way. I understand. Okay. Um, are you familiar with the book Might is Right or this? This. I am not. Okay. Or Survival of the Fittest. It's basically a lot of people tie in Anton LaVey to racial stuff and and um, and almost right wing stuff. And I see his stuff as a different interpretation. Are you, are you familiar with anything about Satanism or Anton LaVey stuff? I'm really not. Tell me. Well, I don't know where to start with that either then. I, I guess the concept is survival of the fit or might is right. This book is about, um, it just talks about how I see it as the, what's going on around us, the honesty of the situation, how it's a really a uh, survival of the fittest kind of thing in, in, in America, especially. So I see Satanism as a, as a true American religion or philosophy. Because, because, because why? Because it's opposed to the survival of the fittest or because it fits with survival of the fittest? Well, it talks about the reality of our situation. It doesn't, I think there's room for interpretation on, on, on different, uh, different ideas in the, within that philosophy. And I see all that. I saw it as a warning. Like I saw it as an art movement, much like I saw the black Panthers or anything like that. I saw that all as art movements. I'm an artist. So I saw it as a way to fuck with things. And um, people take it uh, as a political group now or a, a political philosophy. And mm. I didn't see it like that. I didn't see the Black Panthers as a political philosophy up front either. I saw them as artists. They're the same with the Yippies. They were looking to use parody or satire to get into headlines to talk about their, their situation, maybe. Um, did you see any of those groups as artists or art groups? Well, I think I think that... Um, all of those groups, uh, starting with Martin Luther King, I mean, we, way before that, but Martin Luther King was a genius performance artist, and so were many of the others. That is, Martin Luther King created the conditions where the violence of this society exposed itself, and he did it by performing um, on a very large stage. Um, the story of, of, of kind of black humanity up against a system of white supremacy. And he, shown, he showed it visually by being a performance artist. So do you see art uh, and activism hand in hand or, can, or um, yeah, do you see it hand in hand? Do you see artists as activists? I think, I think good, good activism, good organizing always includes, has an artistic component and that to the extent that art is the, the the role of art is to make a suggestion the role of art is to unleash the imagination then yes i mean there's not a single movement for social justice that doesn't that shouldn't and, and the more effective uh, they are the more they're able to deploy art as um as a 
as a means of making a suggestion or unleashing the imagination. Wow, I didn't, I've never, I, I guess I could see that in some art. I didn't see art as a, always as a suggestion, more of a reflection of society. And, uh, you know, art, you know, I think it was Brecht who first said, the role of the artist is to make a suggestion. And, uh, you know, art is not just, um, you know, kind of pretty, pretty things on the wall. It's not just castles in the sky. It is a way of reflecting reality um, in, in you know in a different dimension and it's uh, it speaks to our emotions it speaks to our imaginations and I think that's its great power and its great strength can you separate the art from the artist of course all the time we do it all the time and why is that because the art the art is a is something that's there to you know to interact with to have a relationship with the artist who created that art is one other flawed you know limited human being just like everybody else and so you don't have to know or love bob dylan to find some of his music not only making suggestions but unleashing your imagination um inviting you to a larger world but you don't have to know a thing about bob dylan or care about him to be moved by his art. And, and that's true, whether you're talking about Picasso or, or uh, Gwendolyn Brooks or Alice Walker, it doesn't matter. These are artists who give you something into the world that provokes you. And yeah, I think Brecht's right. I think he, it makes a suggestion. And again, Brecht has created some poetry and some theater that's, highly moving to me, but it has absolutely um, no relation in my mind to Brecht himself. I don't have to know his biography or to like him as a human being or to, in some ways, idealize him as somehow perfect to find um, a poem like a worker reads history, moving, informative, suggestive, imaginative, wonderful. I think about right now, um, uh, you know, I put out a lot of ugly stuff and it's usually most all of it's been the exact opposite of what my politics are. My heart is it's more of a reflection of what I see or whatever you're, you know, however people are going to take it. And and recently, you know, I've been painted into some corners with this stuff and I re I, I see the Kanye thing breaking loose. And I. You know, I I gotta say I enjoy the I enjoy the I I enjoy it from a idea that it's it's creating this conversation, but I also enjoy it when artists bubble up to the mainstream. It seems they're always interpreted differently. Of course, but but if I were if I were an artist, I would try hard to ignore both the the critic. I'd, I'd ignore the attacks for sure, and I'd try also to ignore the praise if I got any. Why is that? Because those can both be seductive in, in terms of asking you to create a different, an art that's different from your vision of, of either interpreting the world or seeing the world fully or imagining a world that could be or should be. You pay too much attention to the people who are either critiquing you or praising you, you're going down a false road. Yeah. Yeah, that's the truth. It, it's uh, hard to navigate a lot of times as an artist when you do things that upset people. But I think the, the, the point of art in part is to upset people. Right. And, and you know, the great Gwendolyn Brooks, the great Chicago poet who lived right around the corner here, Gwendolyn Brooks used to say, had a, has a poem in which she says, does man love art? And her response is, man visits art but cringes. Art hurts, art urges voyages. And what are the voyages that art urges? Art urges voyage, voyages inside and outside. Art urges us to see the world as if it could be otherwise. That's a great responsibility. But your responsibility as an artist is not to read the morning papers and see what the critics are saying and then respond to them. That's a huge waste of energy. But you have to always be aware that Brooks is right. 
that man visits art but cringes because art urges voyages. And then I also think of the great Pablo Neruda, the Nobel laureate from Chile, who, who uh, wrote a poem called The Poet's Obligation. And the theme of the poem is basically to whoever is not listening, not listening to the sea, whoever's locked up in prison or factory or somewhere, to that person, the poet must come and open the door of the prison. And Neruda argues that the poet's job, the artist's job, is to listen to the sea and gather it up in a perpetual cup so that wherever those in prison may be, the poet enters with the, the sound of the sea. And so his last line in that poem is something like, um, so it's through me that freedom and the sea will answer to a shrouded heart. Now, that's a beautiful, beautiful sentiment. What he's saying is that your job as an artist is to see the world as fully as you can, as best you can, through as many interesting imaginative angles of regard as you can, and then to gather that vision up and to move in and out of prison cells. And I think he means the prison to be ignorance, backwardness, a lack of knowledge, lack of awareness, lack of consciousness. And the poet's job is to bring the sound of the sea to the prisoner. And it's through me, through the poet, through the artist, that the sea will answer. Freedom and the sea will answer to the shrouded heart. I love that vision of the artist. But notice, none of the people I'm talking about or quoting have anything at all to say about what the critics might think of you. Fuck the critics both the ones who love you and the ones who hate you. Yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm cool with that. It's just harsh when you're misinterpreted and it's hard to be... Uh, Come on, man. I've been misinterpreted my whole life. So as everybody I know. That, um, if I misinterpret it, I mean, how do you know your interpretation is right? You're misinterpreting yourself. And so it's a giant swirling, you know, a vertex of misinterpretation, but that's because meaning is always being made. Each of us is making meaning with what we have. And as we bump up against each other, we make different meanings. I don't know if you've seen the, I got obsessed with Breaking Bad, the series on Netflix, mm -hmm. and then the, the spinoff called Better Call Saul. Have you seen either of those? I've seen Breaking Bad. Better Call Saul is an obsessive nightmare, and I love it. And But I'll tell you one scene that I saw last night. And it, to me, this is a metaphor for all of life. So this, this guy, Saul Goodman, this, this con man lawyer, is, has broken into a house. He's stealing identities. It doesn't matter what the context, but it's late at night, midnight. He's broken into a house in a residential neighborhood. And his associate is a cab driver. And at a certain time, the cab driver comes by to pick him up late at night. And he pulls up in front of the house and he's waiting for Saul to come back. And a cop car pulls up behind him and parks. And oh my God, he begins sweating. He begins wondering what he should do. He's really freaking out. And he keeps checking the rear view mirror. And there's the cop car. And then the scene ships to inside the cop car. And here are these two cops opening their sandwiches and complaining about what's in them. Look at this. This is called a fish taco. There's hardly any fish in here. And the other guy, yeah, look at mine, man. It's all lettuce. What the hell? They go on and on. And it keeps flipping back and forth between the two cars. Midnight. It's dark out. The cab driver is panicking. You can see it in his eyes. You can see sweat forming. And the cops are behind him. They're not looking at him at all. They don't give a shit about him. They're worried about their fish tacos. Fantastic. And that's life, man. We we'll bump up against each other and we have misinterpretations in both directions. They're all misinterpreting each other, but that's life, isn't it? That's what we do all day, every day. Yeah. It's kind of amazing, kind of amazing that any of us can get along at all ever. 
when you think of it that way. It's hard to, to imagine how two people can live together when they're constantly misinterpreting everything that's going on. Forget about the artist and the critic. Forget about your public. Your closest intimates are misinterpreting and you're misinterpreting your misinterpretation. It's the nature of meaning making that it's both, it's subjective. There is a real world, but it's not the real world is not the same for all. It's interpreted and the interpreted world is endlessly fascinating and endlessly connecting and disconnecting. Or as the great poet June Jordan said, in a three-line poem, and this is my favorite right now, three-line poem, June Jordan says, there's no chance we'll fall apart. There is no chance. There are no parts. I like that. It's kind of the theory of unified life, you know? Yeah, you, you were talking about being misinterpreted, and um, artists are probably more so and and you became a pariah in society or some at some point i might you know i that, that's uh that's hard to deal with how did you deal with that i don't think it should be hard to deal with i think you should go inside yourself and ask yourself how you feel what your values are and how to act on your values how to live your life in such a way that you're trying not to make a mock or mockery of your values getting over the idea that you're perfect or that your perspective is a universal perspective. And we can be a little humble and actually arts can help us be humble. Literature can help us be humble. It can help us see that we're not the center of the universe, you know, and, and, you know, look, you and I live in Chicago and it's a vast and complicated place. And if one of my friends from New York says, oh, Bill, what are we going to do about Chicago? What the hell is that person thinking about? What is that person talking about? They, they, they think that, what are they th saying even? Are they talking about Chicago's politics? Are they talking about gun violence? Are they talking about the schools? Are they talking about the environment? What are we going to do about Chicago? The assumption when you ask a question like that is that I have some universal knowledge about Chicago. But you and I both know that just like the cop car and the taxi driver, Chicago is vast, millions of people, millions of closets, millions of drawers, millions of ideas, millions of conversations. And the idea that my view is the unitary view, it's the total view, is absolute arrogance. And if it's acted upon, we get people like Donald Trump or Hitler. You know, they think their view is the whole view. But my interpretation of Chicago at any given moment is not the same as yours or Mayor or Mayor Lightfoot's. We have different views and we have conflicting views and we have dynamic views, not one view. It just goes on and on. When we vote, so, we, we I don't think you should worry too much about your critics. You just keep moving. Don't think about it. Well, some want to physically attack me at this point and stuff, and it's it becomes hard. To me too. Yeah, try not to be physically attacked. Yeah. It, it becomes and it, it becomes a little for me um just that being misunderstood and to a point where it's like that's just not me um has been you know hard to navigate well let know? me let me give you a suggestion what i when i was under that scrutiny and that attack i constantly said there's the cartoon character called bill ayers he has the same name <laughs> as me so it looks a lot like me has the same social security card and address but I don't know that cartoon character. So there's a cartoon character about you. And one of the things you can do is have fun with the cartoon character, but don't ever think that it's you. It's not you. It's a cartoon that somebody drew of you and you don't have to buy it. You don't have to believe it. And you don't have to convince other people to think of it your way. You can live your life and, and know, this is the other piece, know who your people are. Who are you accountable to? Who do you care about? Who cares about you? And frankly, when I was under the most intense scrutiny and the most intense attack, including physical violence and including threats of death endlessly, I knew that the people who cared for me and who I cared about included Bernadine and our kids and our grandkids and my brother and our best friend 
these people cared about me. I, I wasn't going to worry about some bozo on Fox News and what he thought. It didn't. It just. It didn't. It didn't weigh heavily because it didn't have any heft. It didn't have any importance to me. Well, family is important. I'm finding that out. Be, be re reintroducing myself to family, but I attack my community. You know, I attack these odd uh, these things. So <laughs> I'm at odds with everyone around me. That's that's and that's well, fine. Saying, that's fine with me. I'm, not, I'm saying. I'm not saying family, I'm not reifying family or community. What I'm saying is, who are your people? Who is your chosen family? Not, not, I'm not saying, and the, the world that you were thrust into, the community that you came out of, isn't necessarily your community if it's not your chosen community. So what I'm saying is there are people I rely on and I consider myself accountable to, I'm, I value their opinions. That's different than some random schmo on Fox News who thinks I'm an asshole. I could care less. He can think whatever he wants. I'm living my life, not living my life for him. I, I feel you on that. What do you think? Uh, like when I see um, like I guess mo most of this gauge is from online, but in general, artists seem to be held to a high standard, higher standard than people with actual. I don't want to say actual power, but tangible power, like judges. Judges are never held to the same standards as a, an artist, and it's out, outrageous to me. It's sometimes true, but sometimes artists are put on a pedestal that's as false as anything else. But I would say that um, what you, you know, the, the thing you don't want to get into is playing the game of making judgments um, about yourself or about others that are based on kind of ephemeral fleeting um, conventions or styles. I mean, really, who cares? Um, I think that sometimes the highest standard in our society is commercial. So you have somebody like Madonna or somebody, some, or somebody um, who's making very suggestive sexual, um, you know, um, art and that stuff is adored and you have robert maplethorpe who gets banned from museums right, right. So, yeah. so you know so in that way they're taking art way more seriously and that's true of a lot of the right-wing kind of uh politicians they see artists as absolutely terrifying but if that same material is presented as commercial if it's for sale whether wow. people you know, then they're all for it. So, you know, we, again, we can't lower ourselves to making judgments about our work based on either external factors like that or people whose values are really completely, commis you know, commensurate with and entangled with racial capitalism. I, I have no respect at all for the value of capitalism to make judgments on art or on me. Oof. Yeah, well, the commercial, it's like culture vulture. that's how I see that they take artwork from the underground or, and I see things, you know, that I'm part of the underground or counterculture. And it's like all the cool stuff starts there. All the cool conversations, everything starts there. And once it gets above ground, it gets perverted into something either safe or real dangerous. Yeah, it's always true, though, isn't it? It's always true that what starts out as rebellious can be co-opted, bought, sold, and that's exactly what capitalism does. It takes our essential beings, our life, our art, our our uh, capacity to love, to dream, and it tries to co-opt it and commercialize it and sell it. And our job is to keep moving and to not... Not oh, there's two jobs now that, now that you've raised it this way. One is to to keep moving, to not stop, to keep creating what we create, um, but also um, not to get into a culture of whining, because that it, when we're whining, they're winning. Mm -hmm. That's true whether you're, you know, a group of teachers trying to do the right thing in schools, and the bastards are grinding you down. Mm -hmm. You can spend a shitload of time whining about what a bunch of pricks they are, and you're not wrong. 
but it doesn't take you where you want to go. So my feeling is, you know, on the one hand, I think we should pay attention. I don't think we should hide from this stuff. I think that we should open our eyes, pay attention. And if you pay attention, you're going to be pissed off. But if you're only pissed off and you're only whining, you're not going anywhere. So in my view, you can be pissed off, but you have to you have to balance that with being with nourishing a sense of love and generosity. Because only love and generosity will take us where we hope to go as human beings. It's not, it's not complaint. It's not critique. Even though I think the people I know best, the people on the, on the left, are great at critique, are great at understanding the workings of racial capitalism and neoliberalism and empire. We understand it, but that won't take us to where we need to go. Another way of saying it is the great quote from Karl Marx, where which is actually etched on his gravestone. Philosophers have always interpreted the world. The point, however, is to change it. So let's change the world by producing art, by creating movements, by telling the truth, uh, the inconvenient, difficult truth as we understand it, and by staying alive to the world. It, it it doesn't seem so easy as it's just a class war. I've always grown up thinking that probably what it was. How do you see see that kind of concept? Class war? Well, you have the class war, gender war, race war, culture war. This is what you hear. And, well, and I'm, against, I'm an anti-war, so I'm against war. On the other hand, do I think capitalism has created these divisions? Yes, I do. And I think that that when people when people come together and identify their collective um, grievance, that's what, what leads us to understand that we're part of a class and part of a gender and part of a race or part of a, a disability community. I mean, I have nothing but admiration for people who, you know, the disabled community is one great example. There was no such thing as a disabled community until couple of decades ago and when disabled people found each other and could articulate the ways in which the majority society was squishing them and taking away their humanity um that created a movement and that was exciting to me so there are there are clearly limits to those kinds of um of identities and uh, one of the ways one of the ways i would say it is i think that we have to understand the ways in which an exploitative capitalist economy creates divisions and creates oppressed groups and oppressed identities. But each of us is, everyone, we, we should be aware of the inflamed identity, whether the inflamed identity is queer or disabled or female or whatever. We are always more than a single dimension so someone might be queer and also a woman and also disabled and also a member of the working class and also an American and also a human being. So we don't want to inflame the identity to the point that we disappear ourselves into you know, a narrow definition of what humanity is. My, my goal is that my, my, my biggest dream is that human beings can be free, all of us, without restriction, without constraint. And that's a very idealistic notion. But I see I see inklings of it everywhere. And that's what I want to that's what I want to work toward. And that's what I want to live for. Nuance really escapes um it seems I don't know about other countries, but nuance seems to not be recognized in the United States. Well, one of the things that the United States, that our modern culture has done, and it's it's intensified in, in even in our lifetimes, is that we exist in a toxic individualism, and it makes it very difficult for us to see the world as it really is, because when we talk about family values, we we tend to reduce it to my family. When we talk about public safety. We tend to reduce it to own a gun. When we talk about public schools, we're talking about a product to be sold at the marketplace. Those are all bullshit, but it gets down into the most silly things. So for example, why is it that every New Year's, everybody's going to lose some weight 
And it's impossible to lose weight in this country. Well, among certain people, why? Well, the answer is that the food industry is manipulating us and making us think of it not as a collective problem. How do we take control of food as a basic human right and a basic human resource? How do we how do we do that instead of how do we think my individual thing is you know to lose a couple of pounds? It's uh, it's an absurd example, but it serves to to to, to notice that everything has a social dimension. And in our country, everything re is re reduced to the individual. I mean, well, racism is the big example. You know, the, the word racism means bigoted, backwards, stupid idiot, like, uh, you know, Clive and Bundy or Donald Sterling. Racism is also a structure. So we have a, had a mayor here, um, Rahm Emanuel, who never uttered the N word. So in his own view, he was not a racist. He closed 50 schools in the black neighborhood. It's a structural reality. Um, and so, you know, we to the extent that we reduce everything to individualism, we make a huge mistake. You know, I have to, I have to, because I'm on this Zoom limited, I'm going to call you right. I'm going to send you another invite, but I want to bring up, I want to talk oh, about. We're, we're going to finish in eight minutes because we've got eight minutes left. Okay. Toxic gonna... individual. Toxic individuality you brought up. That's basically what, what Satanism is interpreted as a lot of times is toxic individual, toxic, toxic individualism. But I see it, I see that as um the state state around us, you know, it's it is it is how America works, unfortunately. It's our culture. It's our culture. And, it's, and, it's and each individual. And so every politician runs for office with his own individual hero life story. And it's always bullshit. But the idea that we're all standing here independent of social forces or independent of other people is nonsense. Every one of us is standing on on the work of millions of others. That's true. That's true. And we, and we have a lot of luck. But the, the, for me, it's like, um, I guess I come to the idea that it starts with me. At some point, I have to figure things out and, 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 and think about me and what happened that, you know, it all filters through me. So it isn't individual existence. You know, you live you know, an individual existence. Well, the, the tricky part, it seems to me, it, Shane, is that you have to you have to have two understandings in your mind at the same time. And it's not easy. And the two understandings are, I am an individual. I'm the one of one. I'm the one and only. There will never be a one like me ever. Never was, never will be. You think of all the experiences I've had, my who I've fallen in love with, who, who I've you know, had had uh, gone to movies with, what movies I've gone to, what restaurants I've eaten in, what's, when I die, all of that's going to die with me. One whole universe is going to be going because I'm the one of one. On the other hand, I'm, ex I'm one of the many. I'm exactly like you. I'm exactly like everyone else in the sense that I was born, I've suffered, I'll die. In the sense that we share a human culture at a certain moment in human history, and so we're exactly alike. Now, how do you keep both those ideas in mind at the same time? I'm the one of one, and I'm one of the many. Yeah, well, truly. Hey, and one quite uh, unity. How would how do you bring how, how one idea? How do we get how do we get people together that are way different? Well, is, there's just no all, chance. We're all way different, and we're all locked in our own individual bodies, which are decaying at their own individual rate, and we're all you know all by ourselves completely lonely on one level on the other hand as i say we share so many things including a moment in history and a culture and um you know and 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 the human condition so how do we join together we we try very hard to convince one another that we're sharing this moment and we're all sharing planet earth racing through you know infinity at a rapid rate and we should do our best to care for one another. And caring for one another in mutual aid is our job. And it's, you know, in my view, it's what marks us as human. If we can resolve this contradiction, res not resolve it, if we can live within this contradiction of being the one and only and one of the many, that it seems to me is what we should strive for. That's what we should argue with each other about. How do you, how do you, uh, how would you think, uh, uh, 
how do you get an idea across to people that are just polar opposite, you know, totally opposed to that idea? How do you how do you change their mind, let's say? Well, nobody's polar opposite, first of all. And secondly, you know, I've you know, because I kind of exist on the far left in, in terms of American politics, people often think that I must think that I have a very minority view of things. It's just the opposite. I think in the on the big issues. Not only am I in the majority in this country, I'm in the majority in the world. What do we all want? We all want safety. We all want peace. We all want to get along. Um, we all want uh, we all want a decent um, standard of living, and and we want food to eat, and we want a shelter, you know, roof over our heads. We all want the same things, and that's how we find unity. We find unity by finding things to struggle toward that build on that basic moral principle and that build our, our sense of community. Why vote, Bill? Well, why vote? I vote, I always vote, I've already voted. Because voting takes exactly five minutes once every couple of years. You can be a participating citizen resident working on political issues and social issues 365 days a year. And for five minutes, you can take a minute off and vote. And people say, well, people say cynically, well, I can only choose between the lesser of two evils. And my response is that's true. And the lesser of evil is lesser. So vote for the lesser of two evils. I mean, what, are you going to vote for the more of two evils? No. So does it make a difference? Of course it makes a difference. And probably less for somebody as privileged as I am as for some guy who's facing homelessness or facing unemployment. Yeah, I think that it makes a difference in that guy's life. It makes a difference in a woman's life that we've gotten rid of the right to an abortion, the right to control her own body. That makes a difference. Voting made the difference. If people had not said, oh, ho, hum, who gives a shit? Hillary Clinton's an asshole, which of course is true, but she was the lesser of two evils and it was a mistake to allow Trump to get in. So... My answer is go out and vote. It won't cost much. It won't cost anything. It takes you a minute and it won't be a big deal. And then get out of the voting booth and do your real work. Voting isn't the real work of democracy or the real work of participation, but it is something and you should do it. I vote. I didn't. I used to hold a, a grudge against people who did, but that was younger. You know. Well, anyway. that's that's been an argument in my family forever. Voting doesn't make a difference. Well, I'm afraid it does make a difference, but oh. more importantly, people die for it. People who don't have it recognize what they're missing. And what we should be doing is expanding the franchise and doing away with all the undemocratic institutions that define this country. Of course, we should abolish the Electoral College, follow that by abolishing the Senate, then the Supreme Court, and then abolish the government. Then we'll all be better off. But in order to do that, there's no harm in voting. It doesn't take much. You should do it. Thank you, Bill. Thanks for talking. Thanks for talking to you, Shane. I'm going to take off. I got to go back to the drawing boards. Do your art. Do good. Keep rising. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Take care.